Hello, welcome to Thornley Bank Parish Church's Sunday service for Pentecost, 28th of May. We celebrate Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Let's praise the Lord. Let's sing, O God of burning, cleansing flame, send the fire. O God of burning, O God of burning, Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice that as you came to the apostles on that day of Pentecost, you keep coming to us today, making yourself known in different ways, at different times, and in different places. And through your Holy Spirit, you are always present, constantly moving in our lives. For your presence at work in us, we give you our praise and our thanks. Lord Jesus, you come to us in power, releasing unimagined potential, imparting unexpected gifts, and empowering us to build your kingdom. Lord, we praise you that, weak as we are, 
you consider us worthy of your many gifts. Help us to use what you give, that we may share your gospel wherever we can. You equip us for the work you have for us, and for this, with this we give you praise and thanks. Holy Spirit, we welcome you again, opening our minds to your guidance, opening our hearts to your love, and our lives to your purpose. May all we do, all we are, and all we shall be glorify you and honour you. And we make this prayer in the saving name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now to Acts 2. Acts chapter 2, which tells the story of Pentecost. The birth of the church is what I call Pentecost, because this is really when the church became powerful. This is when the church was born. So Acts 2, and I'm reading verses 1 to 21. Let's listen to God's words. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome who were Jews and converts, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonder of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. It's that last bit that I love. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord be with me, will be saved. Amen. Oh, I love that scripture. I, I just feel tingles going through my body. It's just so exciting. The idea of the Holy Spirit coming upon us. Let's sing again. O breath of life. It's fun. 
Today is Pentecost, which I've said, I think of as the birthday of the church. And I wish it was recognized by all churches because I consider it to be that important. There's many churches who just see Pentecost as another Sunday, another date on the Christian calendar. I think it's so much more important because Pentecost is the day when the Holy Spirit came upon those first century Christians and transformed their lives completely. And the Holy Spirit has been transforming Christian lives ever since. Praise the Lord. Let me start at the beginning because Pentecost was originally a Jewish festival and to read Acts 2 is only to tell half the story. The story of Pentecost starts in the week leading up to Jesus' death when he sacrificed his life on the cross for our forgiveness and eternal life. Jesus spent the last week of his life preparing the disciples for the time when he would no longer be with them. And it's in chapter 14 of John that we find the beginning of the Christian Pentecost story. There's a Jewish Pentecost, which is a feast, but we're thinking of Pentecost from a Christian perspective, obviously. So, John 14. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus is saying. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Amen. Are these not beautiful words? I can find myself becoming emotional just thinking about that. Imagine being there. Jesus is explaining that he's not going to be here for that long. But he's not going to leave us alone. He's going to come and live in us. That must be so difficult to understand. You know, my, my dear mother died of leukemia. And it was only nine weeks between diagnosis and her passing away. And if around about week seven or eight of that, these nine weeks, if mum had said, look, mate, I'm going to be dying. I'm not going to be with you physically. But I'll still be with you in spirit because I'll be living in you. I would have thought, dear, mum's beginning to lose it mentally as well as physically. I wouldn't have understood Jesus knew his disciples would be powerless without his presence with them. And so he promised them that his father, God, would send the disciples the helper, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus warned his disciples, both then and now, because we're Christ's disciples today, that the world wouldn't recognize the Holy Spirit. Well, let's face it, half the church doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit. It's important that we bear in mind that the world doesn't recognise the Holy Spirit. We must keep that in mind at all times. Moving on some 40 days, during which the disciples lived through Jesus' death, resurrection, reappearance, and now it was time for Jesus' ascension. Jesus' ascension, get my teeth in. When he would return to his, his Father in heaven. Without Jesus, the disciples felt alone and powerless. They were under the threat of persecution, both from the Romans and the Jews. There was nowhere they could hide. And so they gathered together behind closed doors, locked doors. Without Jesus, the disciples became a weak, scared group. They could no more fulfill Jesus' commandment to take the gospel to all nations than they could defeat the Roman Empire. Without Jesus... They were nothing until God sent the helper that Jesus promised. And this happened a week after Jesus returned to his father. So Jesus had been with them and then his ascension, his return to heaven. And then the week after that, the, the, the disciples fell apart. Any courage, any power they had gone, just scared. 
scared of persecution, scared of death, arrest, just plain scared. And then we heard Acts 2. We heard this wind came, and suddenly they're shouting. And Peter, well, he's he's transformed. You know, Pentecost isn't just another story. It was a supernatural event where God broke through and inhabited the life of Christians. Notice the transformation of, the, you know, the Holy Spirit had on these first century believers. There they were, fearfully hiding in some room behind locked doors when they felt a violent wind blowing through the house. And it looked like tongues of fire touched in each of them. Oh, you can, you know, you can imagine tongue of fire. Oh, gosh. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And they poured out into the streets to celebrate. Whatever happened to the locked doors? There they are pouring into the street to celebrate. People watching them thought they were drunk. They've had too much wine. Look, they're drunk. Or in Glaswegian terms, they're steaming. Others visiting Jerusalem from foreign lands because it was a festival. It was a Jewish festival. There was people from various countries in Jerusalem. They, they understood some of the strange, strange languages the Christians were speaking. These onlookers wondered what was going on, and their reaction shouldn't come as a surprise for us. Remember Jesus' words. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I spoke about Peter. The transformation in Peter was astonishing. Before he'd received the Holy Spirit, Peter was just another frightened Christian. Remember at Jesus' arrest. Uh, he was with them. No, not I. I'm sure he was one of the disciples. No, 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 not me. No, no, no. He's a Christian. He's one of these Christians. No, I don't know who you're thinking of, but it's not me. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, was frightened, wondering how he'd survive without Jesus. One minute, scared and hiding. The next minute, Peter's speaking to the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Then Peter appeals to his Jewish listeners by quoting the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Peter's saying, why are you surprised? God promised this would happen. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit on these first Christians was astounding. These disciples started to take the gospel out to all nations. And many disciples were so devoted to Christ that they suffered a martyr's death. Peter, Andrew, many others suffered martyr's deaths for their faith. So bold were they that they went through persecution. The Apostle Paul. There's persecution. That's how strong their faith was. We're scared even to go into our main street and say, hello, can I tell you about Jesus? In case they say, shut up, go away, you fool. Or worse. We're not likely to be assaulted. We're just going to be ridiculed. And that's too much for us. Are any of us going to be nailed to a cross? A cross like that, in Andrew's case, that's why St. Andrew's a Scottish saint. The saltire has Andrew's cross on it. I believe Peter was crucified upside down. And we are afraid of a few words of ridicule. Talking about ridicule, three years ago, there were a number of respected prophets who were saying that 2020 would mark a virtual Pentecost when believers would receive a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. Many mocked them. Oh, come on. 
another year, another date. Now we can debate whether that happened or not. But I said at the time that I think there was a heightened spiritual expectation among some in the church. And I'm referring to the worldwide church, although I sense that the heightened expectation was felt in Thornley Bank too. There are Christians who dismiss the idea of this because they claim the manifestation of the Holy Spirit was a once-only event that happened at that Pentecost 2,020 years ago. You know, how empty their lives must be. They believe Pentecost was a once-only event that happened in biblical times. I dismiss their view completely. And I stand witness to the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And in the lives of many others that I know. Many in Thornley Bank will talk about the Holy Spirit touching them. As I've said before, I don't always understand God, God's ways. I have experienced his power. In recent years, there have been many predictions from Christians who claim we're living in end times. They see the state of the earth and believe there are signs of end times when Jesus will return and God will bring about a new heaven and new earth. The world's economies are in crisis. We're still living with the effects of COVID. Nations are at war with each other. Another world war is possibly imminent with Putin and the West all trying to get other nations into, I think Finland was the latest one, another border state with, with Russia, trying to get Finland into NATO. You know, it's all saber rattling and, and power mongering. And we should take a look at history. We should take a look at 1914 and 1938-39. And then ask ourselves, what are we doing? Society is breaking down. Our governments are in turmoil. I'm not surprised that there, are, there were some prophesying about a literal Pentecost. But I said this before, I said this at the time. I suspect we're all looking for something to happen, like the Pentecost described in Acts. And I don't think God repeats his actions. If there's going to be another Pentecost, it's going to be something new, something unexpected. It's not going to be the same as this. You know, I'm open to, to God working today. I'm open to God working tomorrow or anytime soon. Come Holy Spirit. And I'm choosing to believe another Pentecost is coming. I choose to believe it because I have a deep sense and a deep desire to experience the Holy Spirit working through my life. And I'd love to see other spirit filled and be so excited. So an emboldened spirit filled Peter, to get back to where we were, went out and addressed the crowd. He quoted Joel, the Old Testament prophet. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit in all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious days of the Lord. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. I was a Christian during the, the Toronto blessings of the mid-90s. And I noted that some Christians were touched by the Holy Spirit, while others were not. And I observed that the Spirit will only break into lives that are truly open to receive him. I think there were some there that wanted to be part of this, but weren't ready to give themselves up to the Lord completely. The Holy Spirit can only enter where there's room. We have to give up some of ourselves if we want to receive the Spirit. Jesus and his, Jesus and his Holy Spirit never forced themselves upon any who weren't ready or willing to receive. But for those open to receive more of the Spirit, they will receive. And they may look foolish in the eyes of the world. 
because people tend not to accept things they cannot understand. And they tend to mock people they don't understand. But if we're open to accepting the Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday and risk looking foolish, I have a Bible verse for you. The Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 And again Paul writes, We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 10 Today is Pentecost, when we remember that Christ poured out his Spirit upon Christian believers. And I believe it can happen again today if we're open to it. If we're open to receiving. I'm going to pray a short prayer. I invite you to pray with me. I'll say a line, and then if you wish, you repeat it. Remember, Jesus and the Holy Spirit never force themselves upon anyone. And neither will I with this prayer. Pray if you wish. Let's pray. Loving God, we stand before you and ask you to refresh and empower us. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may become more effective disciples. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may better communicate and live our faith. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may have boldness to bring others to Christ. We dedicate ourselves as your people in this time and our place. In Jesus' name, Amen. What are we doing now? Hi, we're singing again. Let's sing a great Graham Kendrick song. I love it. We'll walk the land with hearts on fire.
May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. We go now in the strength of God, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all and those whom we love, now and evermore. Amen. May you be open to the Holy Spirit, living in you and working through your lives. And may God go with you in the week to come. Bye now. <laughs>